bombarded with messages every day that tell us we are the most important things on the face of the earth. Buy this, you're worth it. Treat yourself, you deserve it, indulge yourself. In the film Amadeus, I don't know if you've seen it, it tells the story of the composer Antonio Salieri. He was the core composer of the Emperor Joseph II. It's a story about his life, which he lives in the shadow of the great composer Mozart. His life is consumed by bitterness and jealousy, and yet he fights on. There's this one really telling scene as a young man. He's in the chapel. He looks up at the crucifix and he prays this prayer. Lord, make me a great composer. Let me celebrate your glory through music and be celebrated myself. Make me famous through the world, dear God. Make me immortal. How often do we pray a similar thing? And actually there's elements of that prayer that are wonderful. Lord, make me a great composer. We need to pray that God would take the gifts that we have and make them the best they can be. Lord, make me a great person. Make me a great minister. Make me a great parent. Make me a great doctor. Let me celebrate your glory through music. Again, such a healthy prayer. Let me celebrate God's glory in whatever I put my hand to. But how often do we tag the second part of that prayer onto our prayers? Make me famous through the world, dear God, make me immortal. Okay, we may not use those words, but how much do we hunger after human praise, affections from others? It's something in our culture, isn't it, that wants to be affirmed. And so what's the antidote to this me-centred, uh, selfish society that we seem to live in? Well, it's humility. Humility is a principle that's found throughout the whole of the Bible. Philippians 2 speaks about Jesus saying, and him being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. God is clearly trying to impress on us the, the relevance of humility, bowing down, reverence. I wonder if for some of us, we've got a complete misunderstanding of what humility is. For so long, I thought humility was kind of fading in to the background, in one sense, becoming a nobody. I had this equation in my head that when a quiet person equals a humble person and a loud person equals an arrogant person. But of course, that's no definition of humility. I think one of the best definitions of humility that I've come across is by John Arridge, the theologian. He says this, shame says I am nothing to look at. I'm not capable of goodness. Humility says I bear a glory for sure, but it's a reflective glory of grace given to me. Humility doesn't stop us from rising up, embracing our gifts and going for it. It doesn't stop us from being bold, brave, humorous, passionate, adventurous, strong, loud, confident. One of the most amazing characters in the Bible, one of the most fascinating people in the Bible for me is King David. He exuded the most incredible humility yet also seems to be the life and soul of any party. From generation to generation, the story of David and Goliath has been told with great relish. Here we have the Philistine army on one hill, the Israelite army on the battlefield, 
And every day, this great warrior, Goliath, nine feet tall, walks out into the middle and he hurls insults at the Israelite army. He lays down a challenge. Send one of your fighting men into battle with me. If they beat the Philistines, you Israelites become subject to us. But if your man defeats me, Goliath, then the Philistines will be subject to you. So the whole of the army of the Israelites, trained, fearsome warriors, not one of them is willing to take on the challenge. They are terrified. And then this young shepherd kid rocks up. He hears these insults that Goliath is chucking out and he is furious. How dare these Philistines shout such curses on us? He says, how dare he defy the army of the living God? And in front of everyone, he boldly declares, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. I can imagine the ripples of laughter amongst the Israelite army. These great warriors and this little kid thinks he can take on Goliath. Many of us know the story. David persuades King Saul to let him go out. And so he grabs his sling, five smooth stones. He walks into the battlefield, one crack of the sling, the stone flies into Goliath's forehead and he is killed. The Israelites have found the most unlikely of heroes. But there's an amazing truth within this story. When you read it, at no point before stepping out does David reveal his name. He keeps saying, your servant. Verse 32. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Verse 34. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. It's only after David has finally become victorious, standing over Goliath's body, that Saul turns to the commander of the army and says, the funniest line in scripture. He says, Abner, whose son is this man? And Abner replies, as surely as I live, O king, I've got no idea. How amazing is that? David has achieved the most unthinkable and nobody knows who he is. Now, I've got to be honest, if I was in David's shoes, if I was in David's position, I would have definitely played the martyr card. My name's Haley Young, this is my dress, I'm gonna go out and fight, fight Goliath, and I'm probably gonna die, but you know, because I'm being so brave, you might wanna make a little memorial of me, you know, do a little statue, get my right side, that's far better. Make sure you make me look tall with all my muscles. You see, because if I'm honest, there's something in me that would want the glory for myself. But David was different. David's only concern was that one name was glorified and it wasn't his, it was the living God. And that provokes a question for us. Whose name are we living for? Are we living to make much of ourselves or are we living to make God's name known? Humility is having a healthy perspective of who we are in light of who God is. It's not about denying our talents, shying away from them. It's about embracing them, thanking God for them and acknowledging that they are a gift from him. There's this verse that appears twice in Luke's Gospel and it simply says, For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. It's interesting that this verse is, is based around an active verb. For so long, I just thought humility kind of floated down on key people and individuals. That people were kind of born with it or not. But as I journey on, I realise humility is a character trait that we need to actively pursue. So what? things can we do 
to actively pursue humility. How do we humble ourselves? Well, number one, we need to connect. We need to connect to God. You see, humility starts with us seeing God for who he really is. Gathering before the great king, the almighty, the all-powerful, the awesome, the holy. It was St. Augustine who wrote about the moment he first came closely to the mystery of God. He said he trembled for love and terror and the thought of God made him at once shiver and burn with desire. To cultivate humility, we need to grow in our understanding of God. Enlarge our view and thinking of his vastness. It's humbling to remind ourselves of the bigness, the vastness of God compared to us. The difference between God and ours is more than sunlight and a candle. More than the difference between an ocean and a raindrop. More than the difference between the Arctic ice cap and a snowflake. More than the difference of the universe and the room you are in. No limitation, no imperfection should be projected onto our creator. Compared to almighty God, we are but a breath. And you and I need to embrace that smallness. Because it's in that place that we get a right perspective of who we are.